Let us now take our Bibles and turn together to the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 3. I'll read verses 5 through 12, and then my text for today, Micah 4, verse 1. Page 625 in the Pew Bible, the book of Micah, chapter 3. Micah 3, verses 5 through 12, and then chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible is God's inspired and, and infallible and inerrant word. Let us receive it that way with thankfulness and reverence. Micah chapter 3, beginning of verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against them, who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore, you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, For there is no answer from God. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity, her heads judge, for a bribe, her priests teach for pay, and her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. We will stop there and pray for God's blessing to be upon the preaching of his word. (coughs) Today we begin to look at a prophecy that was written over 2,700 years ago, written by the prophet Micah about 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and there's actually a prophecy of the Messiah's birth in Bethlehem in Micah chapter 5, if you want to look at that. This was written before there was such a thing as B.C. and A.D. It was written to the only people in the entire world who had the sacred scriptures and all the promises of a coming Messiah, the promise of Christmas, if you will. But they had, a, they had no idea what that was going to look like, and, and they had no idea how that could possibly change the world for the better. Things were pretty dark. Micah prophesied in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Judah was southern Israel. That was the home of the royal tribe of King David. Through his descendants, the Messiah would come. The capital city of Judah was Jerusalem. That's where the Lord's holy temple was, situated on Mount Zion, the only place in the world where the Lord God, Yahweh, was worshipped according to his word. These are very dark times. There were very few faithful believers in Israel, and things were about to get even worse. In just a few years, the northern kingdom of Israel would be taken captive by the Assyrian Empire, that was in about 722 B.C., and then 140 years later, Babylon would conquer Judah and Jerusalem. They would destroy the temple and take the Jews captive to Babylon. Micah prophesied the destruction of both uh, Israel and Judah because they had forsaken the Lord. There was only a small remnant of true believers. Therefore, look at Micah 3, verse 12. Because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field, 
Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins and the mountain of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. Now put yourselves in the shoes of God's people back then. How devastating and discouraging this must have been to the faithful believers in Israel. They will have to go into captivity. Jerusalem and the temple are going to be destroyed. Mount Zion will be a bare hill. What will happen to the royal family and the promise of the Messiah? What are God's people going to do when times are bad and they're about to get worse? We need to cling to God's promises. I want you to notice that the prophet Micah immediately gives God's people hope. He immediately gives them a prophecy that they can cling to during the darkest of days. Even though the mountain of the Lord's house will be in ruins, one day it will be the highest and greatest of all mountains. People from all nations will flow like a river to this mountain to worship the Lord. So Micah is basically telling God's people, and this message is still relevant for today, don't look at the ruins that are all around you. Look at the vision of the glorious future for you and for all of God's people. I've entitled my sermon, Worship on the Highest Mountain. Let's begin Micah 4, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Think about that, from ruins to renown. From chapter 3, verse 12, to chapter 4, verse 1. How in the world is this even possible? Well, the prophet Micah says it's going to happen in the latter days. Now, you need to understand something about the Hebrew way of referring to history. They referred to history in its totality as the days. So if this is the beginning of history and this is the end of history, the totality is called the days. That phrase, the last days, is literally the last part of the days, the last or final period of human history. The Hebrew prophets did not know exactly when this final period of history would begin or how long it would last. The Bible is very clear that during the last days, the Messiah will come to bring salvation. The prophets speak of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as taking place in the last days. Listen to Joel, the prophet Joel, uh, verse two, verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 28. It shall come to pass in the last days that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. The New Testament makes it clear that this final period of history called the last days began to run its course with the first coming of the Messiah. So if you look at it this way, if the totality is called the days, here's the Old Testament period of time, followed by the coming of the Messiah, which ushers in the last days, the last part of the days, 2,000 years now and counting. So the last part of the days will come to a close at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in heavenly glory. If you look at Acts 2, verses 16 and 17, the Bible says that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven. And the apostle Peter told his fellow Jews that this was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Listen to Acts 2. 16 and 17, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So notice the last days were already underway. The prophet Joel said in the last days, God would pour out his Holy Spirit. God poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the last days. This is confirmed by many other New Testament passages, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. The book of Hebrews was written sometime in the first century. And so notice the writer of Hebrews refers to his own days as these last 
days. The last days were already in progress when the book of Hebrews was written. One more example, 1 Peter 1.20, the Apostle Peter tells the first century church, Christ was manifest in these last times for you. Peter refers to his own generation as these last times. The latter days were already in progress. So the, the, the prophet Micah looks into the distant future and he gives us the big picture of what's going to happen in the latter days. So look at Micah 4 verse 1 again. It shall come to pass in the latter days. He's looking beyond the Babylonian captivity. So he tells God's people, Zion's going to be in ruins. You're going to go into captivity. But let me tell you what's going to happen in the distant future after all that happens. In the latter days, look what he says. Micah 4 verse 1. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain. The mountain of the Lord's house refers to the mountain on which the temple stood in Jerusalem. The name of that mountain was Mount Zion. And the temple was called the Lord's house because that is where the Lord's special dwelling place was. The place of his holy and gracious presence with his people. The place where he was worshipped in the beauty of holiness according to his word. Turn to Psalm 48, uh, uh, verses 1 through 3. Let me give you an example of how wonderful the place Mount Zion was because of the Lord's presence. Uh, Psalm 48, uh, verses 1 through 3. Great is the Lord, Yahweh, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is in her palaces. He is known as her refuge. So look what Zion was called, the city of the great king. That's what made Zion, uh, as the psalmist says, the joy of the whole earth. But the other nations didn't see it that way. They were Gentiles. They were enemies of Israel. The Gentiles regarded the Lord as the God merely of Israel, a local deity like Chemosh of the Moabites or Bel of the Babylonians. And the Gentile nations had their mountain shrines where they worshipped their gods as well. In fact, they boasted about their high places. Their mountains were much higher than Zion, and they were not impressed with the little hill, as they called it, the little hill of Zion. Zion. Micah's prophecy of the exaltation of Zion in the latter days must have seemed impossible and absurd to everyone, even God's people. Not only was Mount Zion little in comparison to other hills and mountains, Micah just got finished prophesying of Zion's destruction. Chapter 3, verse 12. How could it be possible? Mount Zion will lose all of her greatness and fall into deepest disgrace, but one day will be the highest and greatest of all mountains. Look what Micah says. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. The Hebrew word there speaks of permanence, established permanently, never to be moved again, never to be destroyed again. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established permanently on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills. Those are parallel statements established on the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. In other words, Zion will be invincible and supreme. The language here is obviously symbolic. We are not to think that Mount Zion will literally be uprooted and placed on the top of the mountains. And when it says Zion shall be exalted above the hills, we're not to think that it will literally be suspended in the sky above the hills. To be established on the top of the mountain simply means you are number one. You rank first. You're the most important. To be exalted above the hills simply means you tower above all the competition. You are in a class all by yourself. Everything else shrinks 
by comparison. So Micah looks ahead to the last days when the worship of Yahweh will be supreme. The worship of Yahweh will be victorious over all other religions and all other forms of worship and be number one in a class all by itself, high and lifted up. There's other places in the Bible that use this same kind of poetic language of mountains and hills being exalted. For example, listen to Isaiah 2, 12 through 14. By the way, Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. And this same prophecy in, I, in Micah 4 is also revealed in Isaiah 2. Listen to Isaiah 2, 12 through 14. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low, upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up. Verse 17 of Isaiah 2, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And then Isaiah 40, verse 4, every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. So the exaltation of mountains, the exaltation of hills, it's all poetic language. So look at Micah 4, verse 1 again. It shall come to pass. That means it's absolutely certain to happen. God has decreed it and revealed it to his prophet. How else could Micah be able to say this and write it down? Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and Look at the last part of verse 1. Peoples shall flow to it. The term peoples here refers to the Gentile nations, which were a variety of peoples and nationality. Look what it says. They shall flow to Mount Zion. The very hill that they regarded as insignificant and they regarded as the local shrine for a local god. This very hill that they despised will become for them the most important hill, the highest of all mountains in the world. In poetic language, the Gentiles are compared to a flowing river. They shall flow to Zion. The verb flow here is used elsewhere figuratively to refer to the movement of nations, to great centers of worship like Babylon. Babylon was at the time a great center of worship. Let me give you just one reference. Uh, Jeremiah 51 verse 44. The Lord through the prophet Jeremiah says, I will punish Bel in Babylon. That was one of the gods of the Babylonians, Bel. And I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed. And the nations shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. Notice the nations shall not stream to Babylon anymore. Instead, they shall stream to Zion. To go to the temple on Mount Zion, you would need to go uphill. A stream does not naturally flow uphill. This is on purpose. By nature, the Gentiles hate the Lord and his people. We all do by nature hate God and our neighbor. We all need a miracle of God's grace to make us love God and our neighbor. And by God's miraculous grace, the Gentiles against nature with a new nature shall flow uphill, if you will, to worship the Lord on Mount Zion. A supernatural magnetism will make them willing to come to Zion. And there will be a steady stream of peoples according to the prophecy of Micah. Now, God's people, as you might imagine, they expected a prophecy like this, and there's many others. They expected it to happen right away when the Messiah came. All this was just going to happen right away. But the New Testament shows us that these prophecies began to happen at the first coming of Christ, and they will progressively unfold throughout history and one day be perfectly fulfilled at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Micah's prophecy began to be fulfilled 
when the Messiah, the Son of God, was born in Bethlehem. Turn to Luke chapter 2. Let me show you this, Luke chapter 2. These are very familiar verses. Luke 2, 10 and 11. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, who is Messiah, the Lord. Same chapter, Luke 2, verses 28 through 32. When the baby Jesus was brought to the temple on Mount Zion, Simeon was there. Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2. Behold, wise men from the east. These are peoples, Gentiles from the east. They came to Jerusalem. Mount Zion, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The peoples have begun to flow to Mount Zion. And remember Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman in John 4. If you want to turn there, John 4. When the Samaritan woman spoke to Jesus, she wondered about the proper place to worship God. John 4, verse 20, she said, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, that was Mount Gerizim, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Notice the concern for mountains, places of worship. John 4, 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, verse 23, the hour is coming and now is. Notice that. The hour is coming and now is. The prophecy has begun to be fulfilled when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The worship of Yahweh will no longer be tied down to one literal mountain but it will be exalted above all the mountains and all the hills, wherever the Lord Yahweh is worshipped in spirit and truth, according to his word. When the Lord Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the mountain of the Lord's house was officially established on the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. Let me show you this from the New Testament. Let's turn, first of all, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15, when you're reading the Old Testament, when you're reading about the earthly Zion, the earthly house of the Lord, that was never designed to be permanent. It was designed to point to the greater reality of the Lord Jesus Christ giving his life as the ultimate sacrifice for sin so that he might dwell within his people, within all those who believe in him by the Holy Spirit, believing Jews and Gentiles in every nation, his spiritual body, his church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the spiritual house of the Lord, the greater reality. Look at 1 Timothy 3.15. Look at the New Testament's definition of the house of God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now therefore you Gentiles, Paul is speaking to Gentiles, the peoples, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. There is the greater reality, the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God 
in the spirit. The earthly worship at Mount Zion in Jerusalem was always designed to point to the greater reality of the spiritual temple offering up spiritual sacrifices of praise at the heavenly house of the Lord. Uh, turn to 1 Peter 2, 5. This was earlier part of our call to worship. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. You see the spiritual house of the Lord. That's the greater reality. A holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verse 9. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And now Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews 12, verse 18. Hebrews 12, 18. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched. And that was a terrifying experience at Mount Sinai for the people. You have not come to the mountain that may be touched. Like God's Old Testament people. Now look at verse 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. There's the greater reality that you and I and all of God's New Testament people are experiencing right now. Right now, by a miracle of God's saving grace, believers from all nations are flowing up to the heavenly Zion. How does that make you feel to actually be part of the fulfillment of prophecy? The prophecy of Micah chapter 4, verse 1. All of us here today are part of the ongoing fulfillment of this prophecy. Think about that. It's not just 2022 for one country or one continent. It's 2022 for the whole world. The whole world right now is being governed by the Christian calendar. It's 2022 years after the birth of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Right now, the heavenly Zion is exalted on top of the hills. It's number one. From a purely statistical point of view, the Christian religion is number one. That's just from a purely statistical point of view. We know there's, a, uh, there's not a lot of genuine believers in comparison to those who profess to believe. There's lots of cults. There's lots of false teaching and all that. But as of the year 2020, according to statistics, there are 2.2 billion people in the world today who claim to be Christian. In second place is Islam with 1.5 billion followers. Hinduism is number three with one billion. So the Christian religion is number one from a purely statistical point of view. But most Hindus are from India and most Muslims are from Arab countries. Only Christianity is found in every tongue, tribe, and nation. No book is being translated in every language like the Bible is. The Lord Jesus Christ is truly the only unifying force in the world. And I pray that the Lord opens the world's eyes to realize this, especially during this time of year. Many of us recognize that Christmas has been so commercialized that it's hardly recognizable. But we don't have to let that ruin our celebration of the most important event, the coming of the Messiah, the fulfillment of ancient prophecy. More people are genuinely worshiping the Lord today in every nation than ever before. From all over, people are flowing to the heavenly Zion. Think about this. They are streaming right now. Theoretically, it's possible for the whole world to stream to the
the heavenly Zion. This very worship service, theoretically possible. Rejoice in what the Lord is doing. And think how bleak it was for believers in Micah's day. Uh, humanly speaking, it was impossible that the unbelieving nations would ever want to come to Mount Zion, especially when you issued this prediction of its destruction. Think of how far they were from the fulfillment of this prophecy. And they might have wondered, what good is a prophecy that's not going to be fulfilled in my lifetime? That's not going to happen until the distant future. You and I might be tempted to think the same way. What good is a prophecy that's not going to be fulfilled in our lifetime? What about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? There's still a chance that that will be fulfilled in our lifetime. Look at how far we have come. The prophecy of Micah is being fulfilled right before our very eyes, and you and I are part of it. Therefore, when we look at what's happening in the world today, and you know what? Things might get worse. We have to be prepared for that, just like the people in Micah's day. What are we supposed to do? The message is the same. Don't look at the ruins. All around us, don't look at the ruins, but rather look at the prophecy of our glorious future with the Lord and with all his people. One day, this prophecy is going to be perfectly fulfilled when the Lord returns. So let's not forget the big picture. I'd like us to turn as we close now. Let's turn to Revelation 21, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle John was given a revelation of the perfect fulfillment of this prophecy in Micah. He would not live to see the fulfillment. So what good was it? Revelation 21, verses 9 and 10. And you can read the whole chapter because it talks about the new heavens and the new earth. I'm just going to read verses 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Now, John didn't live to see the fulfillment of that prophecy. But when he died a few years later, that's where he went to become part of that great city, the highest of all mountains and the worship that never ceases. And that's where you and I are going to go when we die as well. If we believe in the Lord, we're going to go right where John went. We're going to worship on the highest mountain. And right now, we are worshiping together on the highest mountain. And we're going to be prepared in a few moments and sing our closing hymn, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Amen. Stand for prayer. Our Lord and our Savior, our eyes are upon you in heavenly glory, the eyes of faith you've given to us. We walk by faith and not by sight. The things that we can see are temporary. They will pass away. So why should we put our faith in things that are passing away? The things that we cannot see are eternal. We thank you. Lord, for your word to us today, not to look at the ruins, but to look at your word, the prophecy, the vision you give to us of our glorious future with you and with all of your people, certain to happen. And you've commanded us to let this, this vision of our glorious future encourage us each day and give us hope. And we pray that you will help us to do that and not lose sight of our glorious future. And we're so thankful that you're in control, and it won't be long when we will join 
the heavenly throng for all of eternity. So encourage us now in Jesus' name. Amen.